in some respect, we see people more um, in the last couple of years than, than we might have done in person, in a way, because we have to meet up in this way. And so um, it's somehow easier. Hmm. Yes, I mean, that, I went to a, um, I was at a real conference at Churchill College last week, uh, which was hybrid. So about 20 of us in the room and 30 online at any one time. And there was one session where somebody was speaking from West Bengal, somebody was speaking in the room, and someone was speaking from Boston. No, not Boston, Toronto. Um, and that that you simply couldn't do uh, without without Zoom. But on the other hand, I, it reminded me why face to face meetings are are so important because I was sort of at dinner and lunch. I had sort of used very useful conversations with other other people, which I've been following up this week a conversation you simply would not be able to do over over zoom um, mm -hmm. and so there are there are pluses and minuses and if we can yeah. get if we get this sort of hybrid element working um i think that will be good those it was slightly embarrassing where when at the end of a session uh, the chair said right well uh, we're going off to have dinner at high table and <laughs> 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 Tough luck, guys. <laughs> it, was not, uh, it was a bit bad, but you can't. What else can you do? Let's see what the bud just pop up. Yes. I just popped up. Hey, Robert. Hi Frank, I think it's working okay, but I'm just waiting for Becky just to confirm it is. Yes, is, it? No, it is yeah, yeah, no, that is all right. So I thought you might see my same, message. The same thing. <laughs> oh right, that's okay, that's fine. Good. Right, that's okay. Um, do you want me to record the meeting, Frank, so I capture any questions for afterwards? Or, um, or is it being streamed on YouTube, so we don't need the recording for that? Record but, um, on YouTube, won't it? Yeah, well, it was just last time, do you remember, Lika wanted the questions at the end. I don't think we need to do that, do we? No, we'll just do it on YouTube, no, that's fine. No. Well, Lika didn't want, to put, didn't want to put on the web at all, so... Um, I know, that's why we didn't have any of the record of it. So, yeah, I'm we sorry, I'm just getting... We the questions on, on yeah. YouTube, don't we, so, like, for, the, for this, and then uh, Joe goes in and edits the so, video. Yeah, down. no, it's fine. Um, we'll be okay, yeah. that's fine. So we have them anyway. No, it was just the pay for the actual other record of them, but uh, that's okay. Right, I'm going to go and put myself on mute now, Frank, and hand over to okay. you. So hopefully, everything will go smoothly. It's five o'clock. Um, okay, it's five o'clock, which is summertime, sort of the biggest joke of the uh, of the year. Um, it's just got very cold. It's been quite it was wonderful last year and last week in London, but uh, this week it's uh, it's only got very cold. So welcome to Shacks. Um, bi-monthly seminar, which we're continuing in the wake of the pandemic and will certainly be running for the remainder of uh, this year. Uh, it is both on Zoom and on YouTube. Uh, if you've got any questions uh, on, and you're on Zoom, type them in the chat box and I'll call you, I'll call you to uh, give the questions in, in person uh, after the talk. If uh, you're on YouTube, um, just put them into the chat box in YouTube and they will be passed to me. I'm afraid I can't, we haven't quite worked out how to sort of have live questions from uh, from YouTube. I'm sure it's possible the way the, this technology is developing, which is can't do that at the moment. Um, talk will last for 20 to 30 
minutes followed by 30 minutes uh, of uh, discussion. Now, somewhat unusually, I think uniquely for the first time, uh, we're running this seminar jointly with another organization, which is STAG, the Science and Technology Archives Group. And I'd like the, uh, I'm just going to invite the um, uh, STAG Supremo and Barrett, who is um, at Imperial College, to say a few words about uh, STAG. Anne. Uh, thank you very much um, for that introduction, Frank. Um, so um, STAG, the Science, Technology and Archives Group, was started in 2016. It was partly an initiative by the National Archives who realised that we needed some sort of national um, science, science and technology group for the archives. Um, and so they initiated it, but so there's a group of us who've taken it on. And um, we exist to um, promote and add to, find, collect scientific archives, and it's open to own anyone. And when I say scientific, I mean very broadly to include technology and engineering and any realm of science and uh, that sort of species of thing that we, that people deem scientific or technological. Um, so I'll just, I'll put the, um, the URL for the site in the chat. And um, so please do have a look at the website. So far, we've only really held one large event, um, which was to do with space and astronomy, which we held at the Science Museum. And um, since then, with the pandemic and everything, we, we've decided that probably the, one of the best things is to do some things online. And, and we are very grateful to, to be able to work with, um, with this group on, on um, promoting uh, our, um, our endeavours. Um, so please do, if you've got any questions, please, as I say, put them in, in the chat or in the, um, or on YouTube. Um, and I'd like to thank Frank and our speaker today, Michelle, for having us with you. Thank you very much. I'll hand back to Frank. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Michelle de Mio, um, whom I got to know when I was uh, so when I spent part of last autumn uh, in, in Philadelphia at the Science History Institute, where she is the Arnold Thackeray Director of the Otmar Library. Um, and there she oversees the Library Archives, the Centre for Oral History and the Beckman Centre uh, Fellowship Programme. Uh, she's uh, the author of Lady Ran Ran Ranley, Ranley, I'm never quite sure how to pronounce that, uh, The Incomparable Life of Robert Boyle's Sister, uh, published by the University of Chicago Press. Uh, last year. And in addition to being a historian of early modern science, she spent over 10 years of uh, her professional life uh, in libraries and archives, including overseeing the creation of the Science History Institute's digital collections uh, platform. And she's going to talk about some of the issues uh, related to that have emerged out of that work in collecting and describing chemical archives in 2022 opportunities and challenges. Uh, Michelle. <clears throat> Great. Thank you very much, Frank, for the introduction. Uh, thank you to Shaq and to Stag for hosting the talk today as well. Uh, as you heard a bit, I wear two hats. I speak as a historian of science, but I'm also speaking as a library director today. And this will influence the conversation that I think we'll have as well. So um, most of what I'll be talking about is focused specifically on the Science History Institute's collections, but I will make some gestures more broadly uh, to a couple other institutions in Philadelphia where I've worked, as well as draw some case studies from my research. The photo that you see here is going to come up uh, later as a case study in the second half of this talk. And I'm trying to advance my slides, so let's see. Looks like my PowerPoint froze. Do you see it advancing want, at all? Yeah. Do you want to just, if you go to the bottom left-hand corner, Michelle, you should, and hover over, you should see a cut, um, two arrows appear. Yeah. No, just I'm hitting it. That, oh, right. It's working now. now. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. So for those who haven't uh, had the opportunity to be here, such as uh, Frank most recently, we were formerly known as the Chemical Heritage Foundation. We are located in Old City, Philadelphia, next to Independence National Park. Um, some people on this call have been here, I know, I, I see some familiar faces because we are also home to the Beckman Center for the History of Chemistry, and this is the largest fellowship program dedicated to the history of science in the United States. 
we also, I would say, have one of the greatest archival collections dedicated to the history of chemistry and chemical engineering, with roughly 7,000 linear feet of archival collections. The image you see here is the archival facility that we oversee. If you were to walk from the outside on the third, um, walk down Third Street between Chestnut and Market, you would see the Haas Archive of Science and Business at CHF. We've integrated with Old City very well, and those doors do not work. They are just for show and integration. But if you come around to the other side of the building, you would walk into a purpose-built facility, and there's our archivist, uh, Curator Patrick, standing there, where we have uh, dry, it's a dry fire suppression system. It's all climate controls and it's a uh, top notch way of fitting. I think we have six stories worth of materials there in the archives. So what I'll be talking about today, this is called challenges or opportunities and challenges that I wanted to talk with you about. Um, before moving into the talk specifically, I wanted to gesture more broadly about some of the challenges in collecting the history of chemistry today. Some of these are some examples that I will not have time to talk about, but would be very happy to talk more during the Q&A. That includes running out of space. Uh, you see here that there's plenty of space. This is an old picture. There is not that much space left anymore. Uh, space is always a concern. And every time we get a request for donation, we have to consider the expense and the space that it would take. Uh, the other issue is collecting faster than we can process. It takes a very long time to actually arrange and describe and preserve the collections and make them discoverable. Just having a box on a shelf does nothing, really. Uh, you don't preserve unless you've actually described it and put that in the hands of users who can use this stuff. Um, it takes more time to process the collection than it does to collect it. Uh, running out of pots of money. Uh, there's increasingly less money for processing collections. There's a lot of interest in mass digitization, um, developing new tools, but the actual cost of processing materials and making them discoverable is increasingly difficult to find funding for. And that's in, in many ways uh, the, the most important thing that we can really be doing. And following this, uh, corporations today, we, we actively try to work with corporations and businesses to preserve their history, but increasingly there's fear of litigation and strict retention policies, where these the important stuff is getting wiped out of the records before they even make it to us. And that's going to affect the future history of chemistry. So those are some of the larger issues in uh, collecting the history of chemistry today. But since I only have 20 to 30 minutes, I'm going to focus my talk specifically on diversifying the archives. Uh, this is a topic that has received increasing attention over the past two decades among historians as well as archivists and library professionals. I will say that our, at our institution specifically over the last couple of years, there have been some high profile movements that have caused us to really look internally and think about uh, how to respond. Um, some of these include the Me Too movements, but also very specifically Black Lives Matter was um, a, a very it's something we couldn't ignore and really needed to respond to, especially within Philadelphia. And like many libraries and museums, we turned to our archives and wanted to bring out stories of women. And BIPOC is the term that we use in the United States, Black Indigenous people of color, to try to find the histories of chemistry and alchemy and bring those out of our collections. However, like many archives and museums, and specifically many dedicated to the history of science, we found very little uh, representation in our archival collections and struggled to bring these voices out. There's a lot of reasons why that was the case, um, but partly it's because the institution had not primarily been focused on this topic, but also sometimes it's because the metadata we had didn't reveal the content that was hidden in the collections. So what I'd like to do today is to think a little bit about what it means to collect and diversify the archives. And I'm going to give two case study examples. And from those, I'll move back and think about some of the bigger opportunities and challenges that we can draw from them. The first will be a pre-1900 example drawn from my research on Lady Ranelagh. And the second will be a post-1900 example going back to the photograph that I showed you at the beginning of the talk. So just to start, um, today's researchers 
keyword searching is very popular, um, especially with younger generations, but with the move towards uh, federated searches and union catalogs, increasingly people want a single search. The advanced search function does not get as much search as it used to on our catalogs. Uh, and what we see here um, is some of the aggregates that are trying to pull information. Um, Archives Grid is the US um, Archives Hub in the UK are a couple of the big uh, institutions that are trying to pull all of the information into a single search across all collections. And we do that, we contribute to Archives Grid, but I will say that part of the issue is not you have to have your a specific format, the EAD format, and most of our collections are still not accessible in that format. So one would have to come to our specific catalog and search and talk with an archivist. The second issue is that keyword searching is not often the best way to get at questions around, uh, especially, specifically if your questions have to do with women or people of color, they're often not identified that way in the metadata. So it can be challenging to find that kind of information there. So a keyword search might work if you, your topic of study is uh, penicillin or mass spectrometry. You know, you can do some keyword searches, but if you really wanna know about the voices of women, it's gonna be difficult to just do a search on women in chemistry and get that answer. So I personally ran into some of this when I was researching the life of Robert Boyle's sister. And this is the subject of my book that was just published. So uh, for those who don't know, um, Robert Boyle's older sister, Lady Ronelay, is 12 years older than him, and he never married, and she separated from her husband in her 20s, and Boyle eventually moved into her house, and they lived the last 23 years of their lives together. So she's often been acknowledged in history as his hostess, or that she let people into his laboratory in the back of his house. Um, but as I started digging, I found more fragments and it suggested to me that she was responsible for more than we previously gave her credit for. This included uh, acknowledgements in printed works. Gilbert Burnett gave the eulogy at Boyle's funeral. And he said, she lived the longest on the publicest scene and she made the greatest figure in all the revolutions of the kingdoms for above 50 years of any woman of our age. And he concluded such a sister became such a brother. I also have uh, John Evelyn, another fellow of the Royal Society, who called her a person of extraordinary talents. Henry Oldenburg, the first secretary of the Royal Society, had his mail sent to her and called her that very noble and pious Lady Ronelay. They were actually associated with each other before Boyle even moved into London. Uh, John Milton, the author of Paradise Lost, hired uh, hired her, was hired as a tutor. She hired him um, to teach her son, and he thought very highly of her as well. He said, um, so I think, you know, when you, when you consider this, it's very fair to say that everyone who knew her loved her, and she had a very public presence at her own time. And so what's interesting about this is that when people talk about why women have not been put into the history of science, sometimes the issue is that the, the histories that they present are not they don't fit squarely within the history of science in the way that we've told the narrative before. What's interesting about Ronelay is that she does actually fit very neatly within the history of chemistry. She, she knows all the, the big men of the time. She's connected to all the top groups. So how is it possible that someone who was acknowledged as a public figure in the 17th century and would fit squarely into how we understand the history of chemistry today has gone missing from history was my question. The reason, part of the reason about this is the way that archive women and gender have worked within archives, both in their own lifetimes and how we as professionals have treated them since then. So when Boyle died, uh, he identified literary executors to collect his books and manuscripts. He had labeled boxes and folders with color coded ribbons in his bedchamber and his great room. There were archival documents in his flat chest of drawers in the laboratory and he maintained several detailed inventories over the years, with the last one dated just the final month before his life ended. And then the Royal Society received Boyle's letters and papers in 1769. They didn't get the entire collection because it did switch hands many times over the years, but there was still an estimated 15,000 folios. So the first attempt to tell Boyle's story was as early as 1699. He never really fell out of public awareness. Lady Ronelay, on the other hand, it's a completely different story. 
Uh, she and Boyle Bolt died in 1691, within a week of each other, in fact. And it was in the mid 1700s that I know of the first uh, genuine attempt to pull this together was George Ballard, who compiled, he was compiling a book called Memoirs of Several Ladies of Great Britain who have celebrated, who have been celebrated for their writings of skill in the learned languages, arts, and sciences. And he lists 17 ladies and gentlewomen whom he knew were persons of distinguished parts in learning, but he regretted that he was able to collect very little else relating to them. So part of the issue is she didn't, it would have been inappropriate for her to collate her archive in the way that it would have been for Boyle. Um, we also then have centuries of individuals, uh, archivists and collection stewards who would have preferred the archives of Boyle over Lady Ronelay, perhaps. Um, so there's both cultural, cultural issues, both in the time of collecting and since then, what we prioritize and what histories we tell. So if I was wanting to know um, this question, who is she? What did she do? What was she responsible for? It requires content knowledge and biographical knowledge of my source and identifying the men whom she knew and was associated with. I then find their archives, and I pray that the finding aid is comprehensive enough that I can work backwards from there and I find her. That's not always the case, um, especially a lot of women were not identified at all, but when they are, sometimes uh, the relation is to the man that they were closest to. Um, in this age of digitization, it is still very hard to find fully digitized archival collections. Uh, I know my own institution, we prioritize images because that is still what gets the most use um, in our digital collections. The archives are extensive and still tend to require one to come and travel for research. So of course that requires time and money. For this particular uh, story that I was that I pulled together, these are some of the archives that I visited. I identified family members um, and identified those in her larger network and that I moved backwards from that. Um, what I did find, um, and I won't go into the whole research today because the topic is more about archives today, but I, I found a surprisingly robust life of her and with hundreds of letters written to her, written from her that were preserved in the archives of the men who knew her, as well as references to her in the diaries and the letters of the men who knew her as well. Uh, so there was, there was a lot there. It's just that none of it was in an archive of hers in the way that there were for the men who knew her. Now, Lady Ronelay is not alone in this. I use this as a case study because it's closest to my research and I did spend about 10 years uh, trying to tr locate everything, but she's not alone. Uh, in a book, I, I, Carol Powell's Accidental Archive um, in the Archival Afterlights collection is fantastic for talking about the situation more broadly um, on the history of women. But this quote from Anna Maria von Sherman, who is a Contemporary, they contemporary of Ronelais, though they probably did not know each other. Um, she says, women scholars, she says, are soon enveloped by a useless obscurity upon their deaths. The memorials to women's names are not more in evidence than the traces left by a ship crossing the ocean. And I think it's really a powerful statement because it reminds me very much of what I encountered in trying to find Lady Ronelay. She was like a ship, she made waves in her time. Everyone saw her, everyone knew her. And then the ship passes and the waves die down and there's no evidence that she was ever there. It's, I think, um, a very powerful quote and one that is representative of the larger issues we deal with. Um, so for me, in pulling this together, um, I will say it's it's easier to do this today than it ever was before, thanks to additions like Michael Hunter's works on Robert Boyle, which includes an intensive and very detailed uh, inventory at the end and index, uh, as well as thanks to digitization and modern editions that I can now search the Heartlet papers online, for instance, and I can identify sources that were never there. So my hope is that this will get easier um, for people in the future to study the women in the history of chemistry. So if we were to take this as a case study and think out, what are some of the takeaways and opportunities for us today, those of us who oversee archival collections? Um, I would, I strongly encourage the investing of time in modern scholarly editions. I think that increasingly I have had young junior scholars invest in this and they're told that it's not a great career move because it's not going to get you on the tenure track. Um, it's a shame to me because I think honestly having 
carefully documented modern collections allows us to do the work that historians need to be doing. And I, I don't think there's anything that can honestly replace it. Um, improving the metadata in archival collections and descriptions is important for us. Um, more product, less product, more product, uh, sorry, more process, less product. I always get this confused. Something we talk about today, how much time do we want to spend? Do we just push it all out there or do we spend time to actually document the metadata carefully? We here have been prioritizing quality over quantity. We might move a little slower, but I will say that our finding aids, I, I, I like to think, are, make our materials very discoverable in the end. Prioritizing disambiguation is something that is important, especially for digital data. I mentioned the Hartlib papers. The problem with that database is that her name is spelled over 20 different ways across the archive. So you need to guess a bunch of different ways. I know so, several other people here have used the Hartlib papers. It's an early example um, of a digital project, but as linked data becomes um, increasingly used across libraries, I would encourage us to make use of these new technologies. And I hope that I, I would like to consider uh, more collaboration across our repositories. If one thinks that for women specifically, but also I think people of color, that they're, they're not collecting their archives in the same way that the giants in the history of science who were more well-off white men were doing, we do have to think in a more dispersed manner. And if we do that, maybe it's a time for collaboration and we stop looking inward and thinking about a collection as a single entity, but could a collection be more broad and could we be bigger if we can aggregate this information into one place? And finally, it's I would say teaching younger generations. Uh, like I said, the keyword search is is very popular uh, mechanism for coming in and beginning your library search, but I think it's important for archivists and librarians to teach research skills uh, to people at different generations and explain the need for talking to your librarians, but also uh, how what, what research actually is and that it's not just a, a one quick word search in a Google. So with that, I'll move into uh, part two of uh, my talk, which is on the post 1900s collections. There are similarities between these collections, but also some differences. And I'll start with a quote from the Society of American Archivists, which says, archivists collectively seek to document and preserve the record of the broadest range of individuals, socioeconomic groups, governance, and corporate entities in society. Archivists embrace the importance of identifying, preserving, and working with communities to actively document those voices that have been overlooked and marginalized. Now, it is, I think at this point, uh, we've had a, a sort of reckoning um, in archival and library professions to say we, you know, traditionally have collected um, less uh, diverse groups than we wish to, and we we want we seek to change that moving forward. Um, but at the same time, it can be a challenge uh, for a variety of reasons that I will go into here. Um, it is also, I will say, well known and accepted at this point that there is intellectual and social value judgment in the curatorial work that we perform. So what we choose to, pres to preserve and how we describe it will shape any future narrative or history that can be told. It's important that historians and archivists and librarians work together on this. So while um, I'll talk um, more specifically about some of the challenges with collecting as we try to diversify our archives today. And the start of this would be the rising prices with book traders and auction houses. And I do mean this specifically in terms of diversity. So previously, some of the works from women or people of color were actually some of the cheapest things that you could buy because they weren't necessarily the Nobel laureates or the people who have name recognition and could be pulled off in an autograph collection. Uh, they're now, they realize that there is a professional reckoning happening and that people are trying to diversify. And it's actually become extremely expensive to buy these works. Things that we previously bought for much cheaper are now actually very expensive. And it does beg the question, will this mean that just the largest institutions will be able to tell this story in the future? Only those who have the money to purchase these. Um, outdated collecting policies might also be an issue. Ours previously said that we, ex I wouldn't say ex explicitly, but uh, we definitely prioritized uh, the work of Nobel laureates and 
the, the very top 1% crust of the chemical and chemical uh, engineering industries. And these, this is still important to us, but previously we may have not collected someone who was not number one. Again, this idea about space and money, you always have to make, you have to say no sometimes. Um, now, increasingly, we will say that we are taking something even, it is now important to us if someone is the first African American woman or the first or the first woman to do something that is now important, even if it's not necessarily the Nobel laureate uh, who was tagged with this. We're also trying to not just get the lead scientists, but more uh, a broader view and actually take on laboratory practice, acknowledge technicians and have a broader view of how science is made than we used to before. Uh, rebuilding trust and networks within new communities is important but can be challenging. We've reached out um, to some communities of color and I you know, I think that there's sometimes a trust issue. They've never heard from us before. Why do they want to why do they want to work with us now? Why would they? Why would they trust us? And this is something I can get a little bit more into, but it's it's been interesting. And what I've found uh, also is that some of our assumptions when we approach people, we are assuming because we have for decades, we're dealing with um, individuals who are looking for a tax write-off. And what we're actually dealing with now as we're expanding our network is is the opposite. It's people who maybe can't pay their taxes and now they want us to uh, pay them or buy the archives off them. And we have policies that say we can't do that and we don't we don't actually value collections. And so this is it's changed the way that we do business internally and how we think about uh, expanding our collections. Uh, and uh, competing with other repositories that are explicitly collecting the history of women and uh, black and indigenous people of color. This has happened more than once where we've reached out to someone because we're interested and they say to us, I've already committed to, it might be their alma mater, which is um, a historically black college and university, or it might be a dedicated special collection such as uh, the Iowa State Archives of Women in Science and Engineering. And this makes complete sense, but it does beg the question, are we potentially unintentionally creating a bifurcated history of chemistry where these uh, diverse groups are now going to be in one place and then we're going to be telling a different story. I mean, obviously, I think the the, the end goal is to have a comprehensive history of, of history of chemistry, which is subject specific and has women as well as men and has white people instead of black and indigenous and all of that in one place. But if we are teasing out collections based on identity, does the subject become more dis more disfused um, as a result of that? So the other issue I've talked, uh, I started this by talking about collecting challenges, but sometimes the challenge is in the description. Sometimes we already have the archives, but the, the description of them needs some improvement. And this goes back to the image that I started with. Reparative description is the term that we use. I, I think you probably use it in the UK as well, um, but the NARA description of this from our National Archives and Records Administration of reparative description, quote, we commit to using innovative methods to find, assess, and repair descriptions with harmful terminology, valorizing terminology, and under description. We will seek to use individuals and communities preferred terminology while recognizing that including outdated terminology in descriptions can provide researchers with important context and access points into historical records. So this under description is, is an example. Uh, this particular photograph that you're looking at, we previously had it in our catalog as Dr. Michael Samoji and five laboratory assistants. So it, you look at this and, okay, you can guess who Dr. Michael Smoji is, the only man. They did not know who the women were. And so there's both the um, not knowing who they are, but also the assumption that they were all laboratory assistants. And that was the uh, thing that our, our curator found. Uh, the curator of image archives at the time was Hilary Kativa. And we knew that Dr. Smoji was a biochemistry professor. He performed foundational clinical trials in the use of insulin to treat diabetes. But who were these other women and how could she even take place in reparative description when she looked through the archives, she found no names. And even if she did have a name, how would she link it to the people in this without the context? So what she did was, uh, was actually really interesting. She took to social media 
and she teamed up with our social media coordinator, Rebecca, and the post went viral. They did this actually to team up with uh, Women's History Month, March, which is where we are today. Um, and they pushed it out and asked people if they could identify any of the women in the photograph. And the St. Louis Post-Dispatch newspaper found this. And because the laboratory was in St. Louis, they asked their readers if anyone could help recognize these individuals. And within 72 hours, four of their readers recognized that the woman in the back row is Dr. Irene Carl. She is a biochemist. She worked on diabetes and sepsis, and she was an authority on muscular metabolism. Um, on the left, I think there's, you can see the whole uh, article on our website. This was from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch where they interviewed our curators. They were very proud that their readers were able to help us. Um, and after this happened, we were able to update the record. And so if you go in our digital collections, which is digital.sciencehistory.org, you can find this. Uh, and Hillary, the curator at the time, this is what reparative description looks like. She identified the people who are there. She also says the remaining women in the photograph are unidentified because we don't know if they're laboratory assistants or if there are other doctors in the room. And it has a much more um, descriptive text of what, what we're actually looking at in the picture. So I use this as my case study and pull out by saying, what are some of the opportunities today? Uh, I liked, you know, I talked about the challenges, but I think it's always important to think about what the opportunities are. And I would say using social media in creative ways can have unexpected cons consequences such as this, it was fantastic. And at the end of the day, it's very low stakes because we talked about this, you know, you, it did not take very much time to put that out there. Sometimes things go viral, sometimes they drop flat, but at the end of the day, it's so low stakes and it can have things that can have, results that you would never anticipate. Um, diversifying staff and leadership is also important. And this is something that different, you know, different staff of different uh, ages and ethnicities and genders does bring different opportunities. It makes you think differently about collecting and describing. Um, having a curator like Hillary bring this to, to the table was, was new for us and it had a really exciting result. Um, engaging in DEI training is something we are doing as an institution right now, and I'll say it's we've had predominantly uh, positive effects to this right now. We're acknowledging we are a predominantly white staff that is highly educated, and this has provided us with an opportunity to listen and to learn from others, everything from cultural competency to conflict resolution. Uh, collaborating with other archival repositories, I think, is very, very, very important, and this kind of goes back to what I was saying with the pre-1900 examples, but I'd love to really strengthen it here too. I just think this increasingly is a time when archives need to stop thinking internally about this is the collection under my control, but think about it from an end user perspective and what is best for history of chemistry as a whole. And at the end of the day, that's, that's collaboration. And some one of the um, curators on my team regularly works with people and if if we're not the best host institution we reach out to other institutions and give leads and and our other partners do the same around this area and i hope that we'll continue to do to do that and not see other archives as competition but rather that we're all in this together to preserve the history of this industry for future historians so I want to end my talk with a special thanks to my archival team here. Uh, some of this talk was developed in conversation with, with them. And there is my email address and Twitter, and I'm happy to have discussion and conversation now. Thank, thank you, Michelle. That was really, <clears throat> that was a really super, <clears throat> excuse me. That was a really super thought, thought provoking um, talk. And perhaps uh, uh, in my usual chair's manner, I can, uh, exercise my usual right of asking the first uh, question to get discussion going. Uh, if you have, if anybody has a question on Zoom, please please let me know in the chat box, and uh, otherwise, I'll, and and uh, on it's ditto in um, YouTube that we that we fed directly uh, to me. Um, can I just sort of kick off by this something you sort of mentioned right at the beginning, and that was um the way uh business and i presume government are sort of quite seriously 
removing key material from the uh, archive before it actually reach, reaches an archivist. I mean, there are lots of examples in particularly I'm familiar with the National Archives in this country where this sort of government just sort of releases a document and half of it is just sort of black redacted uh, material, which is seriously unhelpful. Um, I'm just wondering how, how how does one actually sort of go around go about addressing that problem? I mean, I'm, I'm a, I mean, as you know, I'm a sort of 18th, 19th century historian, so I don't actually have to deal with this issue. But I can see anybody working in sort of 20th, late 20th, early 21st century going to have real problems with sort of producing any kind of worthwhile narrative. And as events in the Ukraine show, it is absolutely vital to have good historical, uh, well evinced uh, narratives. Otherwise, uh, we just people just run amok. Yes, you're right. And to be very honest, I think this is just going to be a challenge moving forward. Uh, we do, yes, destroying archives has a long history. I mean, that is true. <laughs> if we think back that uh, how many people have burnt their own archives or destroyed them. Um, but I, I will say that it's, it's a challenge. Um, by the time it gets to us, it's already been wiped. Uh, across the board, especially with chemical industries and corporations. One of the interesting things that we have found, though, is personal papers from individuals can sometimes reveal more. And we have had people who've worked at companies who have their own archives or stash of materials that later when they die and their widow comes to us and says, I have all these materials. Sometimes that's actually some of the best material is individuals who worked at these places and, and didn't have them anymore. But uh, I'd be curious if other archivists on here have other thoughts on that. But I, I do think it's a challenge that we're going to have to be facing moving forward. And there's there's no way around it at this point, I don't think. There's strong retention policies uh, in corporations today. Yeah. Steve, John, uh, sorry, Anne, you're, you're first. Do you, want, do you want to ask a question based on what you put in? Sorry, I just put something in the chat about a, a, a book, Michelle, which has just come out this year, which is to do with um, uh, women. It's called the Pal Palgrave Handbook of Women in um, women in Science in 1660, and I contributed a chapter um, which is about hidden. Uh, where are the women hidden? Hidden women in uh, in the archives. So I Perfect. tried to um, suggest how we might find them, very similarly to what you you've said, because we we've, we've had big challenges finding women. I have written a book about women at Imperial um, College because it is traditionally seen as a very male dominated place but actually women have always been there in various guises even if they are as you say relatives of the of right. the main protagonists um so um I, I agree with you on a lot of the issues and challenges and i think that the 21st century is going to be very challenging for us in keeping archives thank you of course the other hey. is, is oh sorry i'm sorry it's going to say we didn't talk about collecting digital materials, but that is a new challenge as well, is increasingly we get uh, offers of hard drives and paper files no longer exist. And so we're also trying to figure out how, how to take our first email collection, um, which is interesting for different reasons, actually, because sometimes people know to destroy their paper archives, but they don't know how much of a record is in the digital archive. And sometimes you think something is erased, but an earlier version of it still exists on your hard drive. And so that is can, can have uh, opportunities as well, but also ethical challenges where we need to educate those who are donating to us and make sure that they know what they're donating. Yeah, so I mean, that's, that's an interesting one because I remember when um, the founder of Pugwash, whose name I'm trying desperately to remember at this precise moment, died. Uh, it took three pantechnicans of to take all his papers uh, down the baths, sorting out. Um, um, Joseph, Joseph Rockblatt and actually the Centre for Quantum Archives um, yeah. completed what we had of those papers in the, in the next yeah. generation after the National Cataloging Unit. Yeah. So we, we completed that as well. And it was a, hu a huge archive. It's still big, still... I mean, he, he needs a decent biography. But somebody's got to spend their, virtually their entire career doing it, I think. Um, Gary, do you want to sort of expand on what you 
put there. You're muted. You're muted. No, yeah. I, uh, I worked at a place called the Mellon Institute for Industrial Research when I was at Carnegie Mellon. And it's a very important part of the American scene. Uh, but the director of the Mellon Institute burned his archives so that no one would know what he was up to during World War II. He, he played a major role uh, in Washington uh, during that period. Also, my research advisor, Paul Flory, and I'm actually his biographer, he's a Nobel Prize winner, uh, came in after that and there was nothing. <laughs> it was a tabula rasa by design because they didn't want people to know what they'd been up to. So the, the, this idea of destroying stuff to protect uh, yourself against uh, discovery uh, it go, goes back thousands of years. Uh, that's just, just, just the way people are. I mean, the, we're in the humanities. <laughs> we're humans. We need to recognize that human factors often are the most important factor in what we're dealing with. I think Michelle has really helped us see that the multivalent approach where you really take into account so many other realities of human culture uh, will get much further than just kind of a mindless collection. Do you want to say anything to that, Michelle? I would I would agree with you, Gary. And I think, like you said, the intentional burning of collections or destroying things is something that we've always dealt with. Um, so I don't think there's anything anything new in that. I think about, um, in fact, sometimes it's the people themselves, or sometimes in the case of someone like Boyle or Newton or others, it, these collections change hands before they even get to the library and various curators have picked things out. And even when something comes to the archive, we make value judgments. Uh, weeding is a process that archivists still do. And you make value judgments on what is part of the collection and what isn't. So there's always going to be an integration between the histories that are written in the future and the archives that we collect today. I think one of the things that had always um, irritated me was that um, I was working on George Eliot in a different life. And um, mm. one of her um, correspondents, Barbara Bodichon, um, actually destroyed the letter where George Eliot told her about her, her um, contraceptive uh, um, processes. And I think that was a, re a real loss in, in a lot of the history of a particular person. Absolutely. And um, I mean, not, not everyone might think that, but I, I, think, I think it was. And I think it was a real shame that that happened. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I've, I've got a student uh, who is working on the Airy Archive in the World Greenwich Observatory. And I told him that Airy did not throw away a single bit of paper throughout his entire 50 years as Astronomer Royal. And he went up to Cambridge to have a look at it and came back and said, yes, you're right. Uh, but the thing about that is, I mean, what, a lot of it would, be, would have been classified as ephemera. But it's now, now it's, it's the only example of things that, things that exist, or programmes of British Association meetings, tickets, thing, things that are sort of, of extreme interest to sort of social, social historians of science, uh, particularly. And I think that sort of raises another issue that you mentioned, uh, Michelle, at the beginning, and that's the question of accessibility and cataloguing. I mean, I once remember having a big run in uh, with the Heritage Lottery Fund, um, who, because I wanted some money to catalog some collections at the Royal Institution to make them accessible. And I explained to the HLF that in order to make them accessible to people, they had to be catalogued and they simply refused to <laughs> accept it. But some of us seem to think that because they were in a public collection, people would come and, come and access them. I mean, yeah, it was just, it was, it was a sort of very Kafkaesque uh, conversation. <laughs> um, Stephen Johnson, next. Hi, thanks very much, Michelle. That was that was very very interesting to hear, and and the kind of both the care and the creativity that is being devoted to to uh, to those questions is is, is really is, is really good to hear. And I think it's something that um, my own institution would be interested in 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 sort of connecting up a bit more because the, these are challenges that that we all face. And um, I, I wanted just to, to ask you um, on the you know on the question of how does one go about diversifying, while also 
recognizing those commercial pressures that you, that you talked about, the way that, that there's, you know, that social change equals or drives commercial change uh, as well. Yeah. And, and, I, and what I wanted to ask you is, um, you know, that as things become commercialized, that, that were previously deemed to be, you know, not, not valuable in inverted commas, um, then you need, I think you need to develop more sort of proactive strategies for, for, for collecting. You know, you can't just sort of trust that the market will, you know, the, 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 the hand of the market will magically deliver everything. And so, and, and so I'm wondering whether, you know, are, are you, you know, actively trying to develop relationships with you know, potential, you know, whether, whether it's a, a corporation or a, a research department or an individual researcher, so that you can, so that you've already got a foot in the door before and anything might, you know, might go out into the world. And obviously that has its risks because you might be pursuing what turns out to be a sort of, you know, a blind alley. Um, but so I'm interested in, in, in that and whether that, that is a way around or to try and tackle some of those challenges. Um, and if, if, if I can just, you know, keep, keep the floor for a second, whether that also relates, um, do, do you, have a separate oral history program, um, because for a lot of the people that you're talking about, you know, textual records are not the primary medium that, that they operated in. And oral history or material history might be a way to, to actually activate voices that don't get preserved in text. Absolutely. That, it's funny, Stephen, before I was going to answer your question by talking about oral history and then you <laughs> jumped in. So yes, we have a, an oral history program as well. We have about 1200 oral histories in the collection right now. And that is something we've just started talking about a bit more. It used to, I think, be a little bit two different separate parts of our organization. And we're, we're just pulling them together with a more collective strategy now. And some of that conversation has been, can we use oral history as a way of starting to inter meet people, build that story out, like you said, and then also ask for the paper archives as part of that. It sometimes works, um, but that, and sometimes it goes the other way too. Sometimes the archivist will go over and collect paper archives. And in the conversation, you realize someone has a really great story. And then as they've said, would you be interested in sitting for an oral history? So we're, we're increasingly doing this now um, in a way that I think we didn't always, but this has been a strategic move for us. But building the communities, um, so that, that has been the way that we have been strategically collecting. So the markets that are defined that we're dealing with now these commercial book traders it's still very hard for bound books and rare books and collections of that sort but archival collections we have and oral history collections we've been able to build through network a little bit more and what's happened is sometimes it's it's a brokered introduction uh, that you get but once you get one individual who's really keen and starts to work with you and builds trust in your organization and builds a relationship with you that person introduces you to others and you continue to build the relationship and that's something we're we're doing now and we're having some success well i i i, I hope that there will be scope for for a conversation because i would certainly, be happy yeah. and, and and certainly i mean uh, with that oral history type that's that's very heartening to hear because yeah. i think a lot of past oral history practices it has also been like that archival one of Let's go for the one percent. Exactly. And one, one, one misses out the practice of science and and and, and industry. Um, so yes, great. Thanks very much. And our our oral histories are one. I don't have the statistics to hand, but we did a similar survey where we looked at our oral histories. They are also not not at all diverse. Um, yeah. And so we're we're having that same moment of reckoning there as well. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, John John Christie. Hello, everybody, and thanks very much uh, for a, a very thought-provoking uh, paper. Um, just uh, incidentally, before I ask a question, I have a daughter who's an archivist, and she would completely endorse your statements about it's not the collecting, it's the processing. Uh, yeah. uh, and then the finding, <laughs> you know, uh, I hear about that every day, in fact, at the moment. <laughs> um, uh, but um, I was thinking about, I don't know what to call it, a sort of um, um, overall 
ecology of archives and where you feel you might have a place in it. You see, the sort of thing I'm thinking about is, well, universities have archives. Uh, uh, um, the businesses have their archives. Um, there are very large uh, uh, national foundation uh, 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 kind of archives. Um, so I had a thought, uh, well, a, uh, a kind of initial question just about, you know, uh, do you have any thoughts about where you're placed in that and what you are best placed to do? Uh, as it were, for one thing. And then uh, a kind of secondary thing was about, well, it follows on. I was thinking about big uh, uh, national institutions, say National Science Foundation, Endowment for Humanities, to take the American examples. Yeah. Now, I don't know whether um, their archives are accessible on or, 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 or not, and for what purposes. How do you get to look at all the grant applications? For instance, yeah. And the reason why I thought it might be an interesting question is that, um, uh, say, if you're interested in really getting into the detail of analysing the gendered success rate uh, uh, of grant mm. applications in, right. in chemistry every year, that sort of a thing. And here, coming back to what uh, Stephen's saying about uh, uh, oral histories, uh, uh, I mean, colleagues who do go find out about these things because they go and visit the actual people who make the applications, often with very fascinating results. Um, uh, and, uh, and you can start to, uh, to get oral feedback on that as well, which is maybe something that the Science History Institute could, could consider to doing, particularly on the gender axis, I was thinking. I don't right. know what you think about all that, uh, Michelle. Right. Yeah. Oh, thank you. So I heard two questions there. And I'll yeah. maybe start with the first, which is about where we would position ourselves in terms of our peers is how I would summarize that. Um, we are regularly approached, people often talk to the Smithsonian as well as us. Uh, that's mm -hmm. our major history of science counterpart yeah. here in the national. Um, and I will say, I would say the difference between that, the Smithsonian, it's, it makes sense to put everything together in one place, but it is, it's absolutely massive and their backlog is far worse than ours. Wow. And they're also dealing with space issues, which I know very personally, because sometimes they've talked to us when they're running out of space to take stuff that they're deaccessioning. So um, that's always a trade-off, I think. The other difference in coming somewhere like the Science History Institute is I think our fellowship program. We have funding to bring fellows over and it's a very, I see some fellows on this talk, <laughs> on, this, on this Zoom screen right now. You get the community aspect and you get a concentration of working with other individuals in the history of chemistry in a way that if you're at a larger institution, I don't think you get that cohort and alumni feel in the same way. So this is something we, we do talk about um, as well as uh, when we like our oral history collection and others, we, we really try to have histories that overlap with each other. So yes. an individual might come in and say, I wanna study this. And we say, that's great. Did you know we also have this? Because our collections are really strong collections around a subject topic. Um, so I would say when we're, when we're talking with potential donors, we have these conversations because maybe the Smithsonian is better for them, but maybe we're better for them. And you know, we work closely with these other institutions, uh, as well as Hagley is not too far from us, and they focus on history of technology and business, and we often have some back and forth. We have some split collections from uh, earlier companies that have split, um, that we have part of the company and they have part of the company. So um, that's my short question, response to the first part. The second part you were asking about opening up public data on grants and getting a gendered sense of success rates. And I don't have an answer for that. I don't know that, I don't know that that data is out there, but I think we should probably, we should probably find out what the National Science Foundation does. I'm not sure if anyone else, if Gary or anyone knows, but I, I don't I'm, have an I'm answer. I'm sorry, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't mean, I occasionally read things about it. But, uh, but what the basis of the compilation of the, the, the numbers is, uh, I, I really don't know. Yeah. I don't know either. I think it's a great question. There was a, there was a shocking report from the Royal Society of Chemistry last week or week before, possibly, 
where they analyze a number of professors from ethnic minority backgrounds and found just one. And he had terrible trouble getting grants. He, he'd applied to the sort of various research councils and then never had a, had a grant. Um, now, there's obviously lots of questions about what's behind that, but I mean, there's an a priori case to, um, to be met there. So I suspect the statistics would not, not be good um, if they were found. Um, uh, Becky's got a couple of questions. Oh, normally I ask questions for other people, but <laughs> um, so uh, my questions are kind of about um, talking about producing scholarly editions and um, the creation of more time and, and kind of prestige for those, especially as a, an ECR. And um, I know Frank and possibly a couple of other people on this call know um, that myself and a couple of other PhD students just put together a source book on women in the history of science. So um, not a kind of edited collection of essays, but primary sources. Um, and we really struggled with so it's with UCL Press, um, and I'm sure you know this bit will get cut out when the YouTube video goes up. Um, um, and uh, there was questions raised around, you know, is this useful? Um, does anybody want this? Um, uh, apart from the fact that you know it won't be as prestigious on our CVs and, and all of those sorts of things. Um, and so I was kind of wondering uh, whether you've got any ideas for challenging that. Um, you know. It, it, uh, funding potentially uh, scholarly editions, fellowships at the SHI, or you know something along those lines. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll ask that one question, and then we can <laughs> do this. Yeah. <laughs> can I ask? You, is there a link to your book yet, or it's, uh, it's we, there is a website, but it's not. There's it's, um, okay. so it's uh, currently like in the final review stages. Yeah. Um, I'm very excited about that. I mean, you're you're right that it doesn't have the same prestige, unfortunately, right now, but. To be very honest, uh, I so I've heard multiple times from school teachers as well as professors that getting a hold of those primary sources from the history of women is actually what is needed right now because there's an interest in diversifying history and telling more stories at all levels of education. But it's it's very hard to get access to those resources right now and have the contextual information you need to better understand the primary source text. So I, I would I'll be very interested in this book um, of yours. Uh, I don't I just love to link to it in the chat. Oh, perfect. And, um, there's actually, you know, ironically, two years after UCL Press sorted ours out, um, the Rutledge are doing a five book edition that's going to come right. out. I don't know. And so, uh, Donald Pitts is is um, editing it with um, um, like this, this, yeah, editors for each volume, and it's a huge thing. Um, but it's only focusing on women within the British Empire or something. It's oh, right. Like, okay. So, and on the 19th century. So there's a very specific kind of temporal and, and um, geographical focus for that one, whereas ours is designed to go along with the ancient to, to now right. um, history of science 101 course. But um, yeah, so it's just, um, I was just thinking in terms of, it's really difficult to push how important this is going to be and hopefully Absolutely. people will use it and therefore it will be cited. But, you know, it's, um, yeah. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, and I don't, you know, I, I wish I had an, a, an easy answer for you, but I will say I found, I have found it more liberating to be able to work on the research I find important by not being in a traditional tenure track position in the US where there is a very strict model for what you need to tick the boxes to get tenure. Whereas moving into an independent institution, I can focus on biography, I can focus on additions, I can focus on the things that I think are important for our field. But it doesn't always translate. So I acknowledge it without having a, a, a firm solution for you, I'm afraid, but I acknowledge it. Um, my second question was about um, digitization practices, right, going forward. So um, I was wondering whether we talked a little bit about this, but um, and we talked about how photographs are often kind of prioritized. Um, and I was wondering whether there was space to prioritize things on on. Uh, that, that people are doing on women that as you say which are hidden within other people's archives as kind of collations um i know with uh, ambix there's this sort of edited collection function that we're putting together with the journal and i was wondering whether there's yes. any sort of scope for being able to do that with with archival things of edited collections of things which are in other people's archives so for example you know there's the darwin collection online and things like that right but uh, that, that's going to have some things in um whether there's space to kind of bring that together in other digital places it's already been done um but you know to to yeah. highlight the, these women I, I would love that and I don't think we're quite there yet but I think about the work that um our curator Jim Vogel does with the Newton project as well where there is the same like the the Darwin correspondence bring it all together and if anyone's 
gut stomach for this. I would love to <laughs> brainstorm a little bit more and think about what would that look like to have a digital archive on women in the history history of science or history of chemistry. I think uh, that would be really exciting going forward. For now, we're using um, subject tags that we didn't use before. So at least now, when you click on women in science, you can get everything across our collections. But I hope that we can we can expand beyond just our own collections. But, but I, think that's, I, think, I think women in science is, is, is a part of a much bigger problem. Yes. That we're beginning to get all these digital archives set up. I mean, in this country, we've got big ones in Cambridge and Manchester, one about to go live in Lancaster. Um, and at a meeting I was at last week, I, where they were talking about some of this, I said, well, how we, people don't want to go to sort of 20 places looking for the same thing. They want to sort of have one. Yeah portal to go through and now is the time to do that right at the beginning of this process because if you try and do it in say five years time we probably have hundreds of digital archives it's really yep. going to be really hard to um to to do that and i, I think we, i think perhaps that Anne stag might sort of take an interest in in doing something uh, to sort of encourage uh, a, a, a portal being developed to sort of uniform standards I and mean, you've got a library catalogue, so I don't quite see why you can't do it. For, yes, um, yes, I agree. And that, it'd be good, it would be a good focus for STAG, actually. Mm -hmm. And we do have a digital archivist who is on our, our board, so that um, there's, we've sort of got some way in there. And I think that'd be a great thing. So, Michelle, I'll send you a message later. Talk. We'll have a chat. Yeah. I would love thing. to talk yeah. about that. That's a great idea. Okay, it's now just gone six o'clock uh, in this country, one o'clock presumably, lunchtime for you. One o'clock for me. <laughs> um, so I, I think we'll just draw this to an end. Um, I just want to say that the next seminar in this series will be on the 26th of May, uh, when Hasek Chang will be talking. He hasn't told me what he's talking about, but I will bet a very large amount of money it's about early 19th century batteries. Um, and it just remains for me to... Um, uh, thank the production team. There are quite a, there are quite a lot of people involved in um, in producing these uh, seminars. That's so Rob Rob Johnson, Anna S uh, Simmons, Caroline Cobble, Becky Martin, Chris Campbell, and Joe Hedison. And in this particular case, Anne Barrett from uh, from Stag. And finally, uh, of course, thank Michelle for giving us a really interesting, thought provoking, really good discussion following uh, seminar today. Thank thank you, Michelle. Thank you very much. And I'd also like to thank. Um, Shaq for having Stag and you Michelle that was a, a really wonderful talk thank you very much. Thank you so much for the in, in introductions and for the time to talk with you all we appreciate it. Okay well have a good evening stroke afternoon. <laughs> yes. <laughs>